Hello, my name is Kaylee Dayton. I'm an ICU nurse practitioner with a podcast and webinar program dedicated to delirium prevention and early mobility in the ICU. For me, it all started when I landed my very first job as a brand new nurse in an awake and walking ICU. There it was totally normal to allow almost every patient to wake up right after intubation and even walk even hours after intubation. And it was just fun and great environment. No one made a big deal out of it. So I didn't realize how significant this practice was until I became a travel nurse a few years later and had this culture shock of being immersed into automatic deep sedation for everyone on a ventilator um, and um, could not find common ground with anyone when it came to sedation. And so I returned to the wake and walking ICU as a nurse practitioner. And I started to really take note of what we were doing um, what tools we were using and why the outcomes were so different. And I was just astonished by how much better patients um, could handle mechanical ventilation, how much quicker they were off, all the things that you would expect with delirium prevention and early mobility. This is a patient on a PEEP of 18 and 100% with septic shock and ARDS um, and two vasopressors. And yet they still walked him because that is a treatment for delirium that benefits the lungs. We implemented that research into practice. And he, after his long course of um, ARDS, he did not have any cognitive impairments or psychological damage from that time because the delirium was minimized. Um, and if we did see de severe delirium, it was often because we were receiving patients from outside facilities that had been sedated. And that was always very frustrating for the team because they felt like if they had received that patient right away, that they could have prevented that delirium, or at least that severity of delirium and that harm. But nonetheless, we were always eager to treat the delirium when we found it. So Megan Wakely came to us. She was a 32 year old with um, baseline PTSD and um, therefore alcohol and benzodiazepine dependence and uh, malnutrition. And she developed alcoholic leukopenic pneumococcal sepsis and was admitted to an outside facility and had been deeply sedated after intubation for a week. And I think she was on midazolam, unfortunately, and um, her septic shock was getting worse and everything was declining. So the family was being prepared to transition to comfort care and they opted to have her sent to the awake and walking ICU. Um, upon admission, she was on a PEEP of 14, maybe 16 and 80% on two vasopressors and was still deeply sedated. So once we realized she was stabilized on those settings, um, we immediately wanted to get her off sedation because we knew that she was not sleeping. We were worried that with her baseline PTSD, that she was at high risk of reliving whatever trauma she'd experienced over and over again, vividly in her mind during that delirium that she was at high risk to have. So we were panicked. We did not want her to have a persistent acute brain injury or acute brain failure um, and have long-term deficits. So took, we took off sedation and she was as wild as you would expect. She was probably RAS of three. She did bite through her endotracheal tube, which is very rare. I think that was the first, maybe the second time I'd ever seen that. We did a, an immediate tube exchange, resedated her, but that didn't mean that it was an automatic failed sedation vacation. Instead of saying, okay, we have to sedate her. The conversation was, wow, she has severe delirium. Every day we allow her to have delirium. She's like, going to have a 10% increased risk of death. We have to, in order to save her, we have to get her awake and moving. And so we felt it was safer to work towards delirium uh, treatments. So we transitioned the medadolam to propofol and, and um, dexmedetomidine. We gave her clonopin down her feeding tube to cover for the benzodiazepine dependence. And we just used the propofol to bridge to dexmedetomidine. The goal was not to deeply state her. It was to get her to a RAS of zero and maybe even a one so that we could mobilize her, so that she could connect with her family, so that she could get real sleep. Um, that station was not a long-term plan. That was just temporary to enable us to use actual tools for delirium. And so that's what they did. As soon as she was um, to a RAS of one or zero, we had her up and walking. And after a week of immobility, she was extremely weak. She was still very delirious. She told me, um, in the podcast interview that she woke up walking and it was probably her second or third walk. It probably wasn't even her first walk. They were not pretty. They weren't glamorous, but they were safe and they were vitally import important. After she walked that first time, she was exhausted and passed out and actually slept. So we took off dexmedetomidine and didn't need it anymore. Um, and she would wake up, be agitated. We'd walk her. She'd sleep. She'd wake up, be agitated. We walk her. She'd sleep. So she'd get real sleep, real REM cycles and her brain recovered. So she started to write on the board, connect with her family. She, we brought her dog in 
And though her lungs actually got worse, um, the cavitating pneumonia had progressed. Um, she required a PEEP of 18 and 100%. Her delirium cleared out. We minimize the duration of delirium by implementing those treatments um, instead of blocking them with sedation. And she was a joy to take care of. Um, she was cute. She was funny. She would tell us where her pain was, her agitation, her anxiety, and we could treat it appropriately and accordingly. She was one of the first people that I told I was pregnant in that hospital. We had a real human connections and she walked herself out of the ICU because we implemented true delirium interventions rather than masked the, the delirium or continued to cause it with sedation. And I know as we implement these evidence-based practices in our ICUs, we can decrease workload, danger risk to the staff and the patients and improve patient outcomes um, in the short and long term. Thank you so much.